I'd like to welcome you to Spirit Grow and I'd like to welcome you to this month's very special series entitled Manifest. For those of you who have never been here before, my name is Menachem Wolf. I'm the director here at Spirit Grow. And this is a particularly <coughs> exciting course for us to be offering. And that's because recently Spirit Grow received a government endorsement as a health promotion charity, the first of its kind in Australia. Oh, we'll take that clap. In that the work that we're doing has been recognized as being supportive of helping to offset mental health disorders as well as help in general health promotion and it's actually the holistic approach that we take, including the spiritual aspects that we draw from Jewish spirituality that allowed us to be one of the quickest organizations to ever be endorsed. And that was just four weeks from application to acknowledgement. So this is very, very exciting because this is actually our first holistic program of this nature in which we hope to enable you to live better quality lives and really hope that you come out of this 28-day journey elevated to a new place within your reality, in your life, wherever it is. 28 days. In context of a lifetime, it's not a long time at all. But we have put together this program and for those of you who are doing the quantum course, just raise your hand if you're part of the quantum program. So the, those who are part of the quantum program, which means that you've agreed to coming to all four sessions. Ah, oh, should have read the email. Anyway, <laughs> I know we should have done the program on how to read digital data. That anyone who's a part of the quantum series will be assessed as you go through this and the assessment that we're using is actually developed and has been developed and is being implemented here by us but it has been developed by the head of um, the mindfulness department in Monash University who does frequently speak and has helped us with this assessment and therefore not only are you going to learn something but we're hoping to actually help you beyond the course so that you can keep living with the lessons and the ideas that you're going to um, hopefully adopt, but at least learn over the next four weeks. So 28 days. Before we begin, I'd like you to resolve and commit to yourself that you have not come here as a, specu as a speculator, that you haven't come as a spectator. You haven't come to be entertained, but rather that you are willing to invest in yourself and try to put into practice what the seven speakers feel are the four most important ideas in their field for you to incorporate into your life to see very real change in every aspect of your life. So just take a moment and commit and shift yourself from, we'll see, because we'll see means I'm not doing this, but I know a lot of interesting stuff to, I'm going to give this a crack. And then what we'll have is 165 people here in Melbourne living better, improved lives, which then means how many other people who are in their circle live better quality lives because they've got someone who genuinely is a better person. We could be impacting over a thousand lives by the end of this course. I'd like to introduce my father, 
Labor Wolf, who has worked tirelessly with the team in putting tonight's and this month's presentation together. And he'll be chairing this evening, and he's also tonight's opening presenter. I'd like to put your hands together for the creator of this series, my father, Labor Wolf. Thank you, my son. <laughs> Always love saying that. I'm going to uh, present the first session. We've been taught through recent research over the last dozen years or so that there are two primary ways in which our minds operate. One of them is called nonlinear mode. And that means that we allow our minds to wander, to daydream. That's putting a very soft characterization to it. Another way of characterizing that is being highly creative. The other mode is central executive mode. And what that means is that we're highly focused on a particular task, on a particular activity. In most recent times, parents and community have been very concerned about their children's capacities in the second mode, their capacity to focus. And I believe underrate the first way of allowing our mind to be able to be much more open and creative. What's interesting is when we watch on screen the operations of the brain in these two modes, we get two very different pictures. The picture of central executive mode, highly focused, is one where only a very narrow part of the brain is being utilized. And when we go into daydreaming mode, it's quite interesting, the vast majority of the brain is being utilized. And that's obviously counterintuitive. And yet it tells us something about the nature of creativity. In Jewish psycho-spiritual teachings, the creative side of our operations is called chokhmah, the bringing from the subconscious into the conscious. And the more articulated, narrow-band activity is called bina and da'at. In other words, analysis and conclusive kind of arguments derive from a more narrow band. That's not to say for one moment that one is superior to the other. Obviously, we need every part of the body to function optimally. But it does suggest perhaps that we're overrating in our developmental processes, ourselves and our young ones, one particular aspect at the expense of the other. A very interesting activity that's been shown conclusively to train both sets concurrently is drawing. And drawing and coloring in within defined borders. When you choose your colors, it's almost an intuitive activity of the larger mind, the chokhmah mechanism, or the non-linear mode. When you're trying to maintain the pen within the borders of the outline, you're very much utilizing the central executive mode. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you for the next seven, eight minutes to do two things. You've been provided with a clipboard and an outline of content for drawing, a mindfulness piece of paper for drawing, and you've been provided four colors. I'd like you for the next seven minutes not speak to anybody whatsoever. Absolute silence in the room. No talking. I want you to become engrossed, beginning wherever you want, choosing the colors you want for whatever area you want, and we'll speak momentarily when you've concluded the beginnings of this particular exercise. So again, no talk. Move right into your own world.
All right, just desist from the temptation of now finishing all that, which everyone has as soon as they start, because you've just activated the child within. How did you enjoy going back to kindergarten? And you probably found it delightful. And I think if you looked at it introspectively, you felt relaxed during that period of time. And there might have been even a sense of accomplishment all in seven minutes flat, except that the homework is to go home and complete that task. But I don't want you to do it in one hit, even though it's uh, a very tempting to do so and you can't stop. But I want you to practice some delayed gratification in the process and limit yourself to 10 minutes a day. But... I assure you that if you spend 10 minutes a day in this particular activity, no matter how childlike it seems, you will feel a sense of refreshment, mind exercise, a feeling of inner poise and inner balance simply by doing this. It's cumulative. If you do it 10 minutes every day, it becomes additive. If you do it once, it was great, and then try to do it again next week, that's nice, but it won't actually create the change in the brain that's desirable by this simple exercise. And I assure you that this simple exercise achieves a tremendous amount in your life and affects your decision-making process, your problem-solving mechanisms, and your general relational demeanor. This little exercise. I'm going to pause and stop, but I just want to emphasize one point that Menachem mentioned early, uh, because there was a little bit of uh, um, haziness about it. There's two categories of participation in the, this four-week program, quantum and light. It does not mean at all that one's better than the other. It means more in terms of your own commitment. Those who are volunteering to be in the quantum program will receive notes from each one of the speaker's summaries in their inbox. You'll also be able to forward questions and be monitored and assisted during the course of the course and later on. And also, the questionnaire is central because the questionnaire which is provided at the inception is then followed up with a questionnaire at the end of the course and is followed up with another questionnaire some eight weeks later. And if you're consistent, you'll be able to be shown in what particular arenas and how your life has considerably improved. So we're just providing that incentive for you to be part of the quantum, but in return, you have to commit to being here for the full four sessions. That's the quid pro quo. That's not possible for all of you. And we didn't want to uh, prevent individuals who perhaps for some week cannot come. So there's a light course. And the light course means you come, you take, but you won't be provided with all the goodies in between. But you'll get the benefit of hearing the speakers and taking it away. It's almost like a series of TED Talks here. And I'm going to introduce now Dr. Debbie Herbst. You know, one of the very important things that we're learning and have probably known about, but it hasn't been emphasized, is how much the demeanor of a doctor in the context of advising a client or a patient contributes to the therapeutical quality of the session. And although we've known for a long time that bedside manner makes a very big difference in terms of an individual's uh, um, coming back to health, if they're in ill health, we're now really having very clear statistics concerning this. And we know that when a doctor is hopeful and optimistic and helps the client be optimal, optimally optimistic, the way in which the cellular activity of the body operates is different. So it's not just, oh, yeah, think positive, and that's great, but think positive and you change your body and therefore your immune system and the way you respond. One of the great facets that I find in Dr. Debbie Herbst is her bedside manner. She's not my doctor, but I've heard along the line that that is the case. I'm going to ask her to present for the next 20 minutes. I'm going to actually, sorry, before you clap, I'm going to ring a bell at the 18-minute mark so that the speaker knows
that there is two minutes to go and then at the 20-minute mark. So if you happen to be meditating, I apologize. <laughs> Well, thank you very, very much for the introduction. Um, when we go to scientific meetings, and I'm sure many people here have been at um, conferences and presentations where people need to declare any conflicts of interest. So before I begin, I'd like to declare, I'm not sure if it class qualifies as a conflict, but I will declare that Menachem is my son-in-law <laughs> and Label is my mechutan. Label and Leah are very um, dear mechutanim. Our daughter Rochel is married to Menachem, so if anyone is concerned that that perhaps presents some sort of conflict, I'm out in the open. I've declared it. There you go. Um, I feel very honoured and privileged to be part of this really groundbreaking program that Label has set up. He sent me an email, I think, a number of weeks ago. I think it was a little, not too long before Pesach, when who has time to read their emails? But it sounded so exciting. My I think my first response was, wow, Label, that sounds fantastic. I want to be involved. Without asking really too much else, just the concept of having, as Menachem said, a holistic program where we address a number of um, matters relating to health, spiritual, physical, psychological, emotional, um, definitely from the Jewish perspective, all at one time through a 28-day program that is going to be measured and hopefully reproducible and will make very, very positive impacts on, on all of our lives and, as Menachem mentioned, have that ripple effect onto all the people that uh, we know as well. I'm very conscious of the time. I know I speak fast, so I'll, I'll try and do my best to get through. Um, as you know, I have been asked to speak on the topic, I guess, of, of the, the diet component of the Manifest program. So the question I, you know, pose here is, is you know, what, what is health? What does health mean to us? And, and clearly this evening and this whole 28-day program, we're going to be covering many different aspects of health. And health means something different to, to when we ask people. But clearly through the, the impact of, that food plays in our, in, our, um, in our lives, that's, I guess, the area that I'm going to be addressing and I must say, I've got a new phone recently. It's a Samsung 9 S plus, S plus, 9 plus, whatever it is, the biggest, the newest, the latest, the best. And it's my first experience having a Samsung phone. Now, uh, some of you, I'm sure, have got Samsung phones that where there's a health app on the phone. Um, and I, I maybe put a little bit of basic information, but I really haven't paid much attention to it. Every day I get a little mis message on my phone how many calories I need to eat, how many calories I ate yesterday or how, how many calories short I was or extra calories, or how many calories... Oops. How many calories I should be consuming. Now, you know, on the one hand we can say that is amazing. You know, we're in the year 20, 2018 and our phones tell us how many calories we need to be consuming. When I reflect on that, I think herein lies the problem. We've come to a stage in our lives where we rely on technology, where the medical mod modern medical model is very much a, we are really just glorified machines and food and nutrition is just about energy in, energy out. You put too much in, you won't be healthy. You put too much out, well, many people might say you've got an eating disorder. We are not machines. We are not robots. We are not automatons. And unfortunately, those who adhere really strictly to the way the, the world has developed in terms of the modern medical world is that's really what they'd have us believe. It's really a matter of energy in, energy out. My phone doesn't worry about the quality of the nutrition that I'm consuming. It's really about, well, according to my phone, because it's been with me most of the time, so it knows how active I've been, it's done a calculation that this is the number of calories I need to be consuming. So what I'd really like to do today is, is you know, ex well, explore that and debunk that and really, as I said in my little introductory blurb that, that's been posted, is free ourselves from the notions um, that we've been trapped into that we are much more obviously than just machines that we put energy in and, and expend energy out. What we eat um, literally controls every function of our bodies and our minds. Food really is the most powerful medicine that we have. 
And again, unfortunately, the, we go to doctors, we go to health professionals, and we're too quick. And again, as a result of the way things have developed, to have a pill, do this, do that, rather than taking the time to reflect and explore food, the nutrition that we're putting into our bodies. Okay. So I posed the question, are we healthier than our great-grandparents? I spoke recently to a group of high school girls and when I, spoke to, when I was speaking to them, I was talking about what their grandparents ate. And then I looked around the room. There's a, one of the Orthodox Jewish schools in Melbourne and I realised that some of their grandparents are probably my age or a little bit older. So I probably like speaking to them about what their grandparents ate, probably, you know, perhaps need to go back a little bit. Anyway, so in the strictly modern Western medicine model, health is just the absence of disease. If you're not unwell, well, then you're well, then you're healthy, right? That's all that it is. If we go by how long we live, long, long, uh, long, longevity, well, then we're pretty healthy because we, our average life expectancy now is, you know, over eight, a bit under 80 or a bit over 80, depending on where you live and whether you're male or female. But then we know there's this concept of enhanced health and living and well-being. And that's why we're actually here tonight, is how can we go about achieving or striving to achieve enhanced, uh, enhanced well-being and living. So as I said, our life expectancy is now at all-time record highs, but are we actually healthier? Previously, in years gone by, there were many, many environmental and other factors that were the main determinants of people's health. Infectious disease, poor sanitation, poor housing, uh, not enough food, not enough energy, you name it. There were multiple, multiple... You want that as well? It might be easier for you. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it's okay. Are you all right? Yeah. Um, there were multiple, you know, determinants of people's health and why people didn't have such long, long lives that we are fortunate and privileged to live in this day and age. Now, the current main barrier to health, enhanced health and well-being, is our lifestyle. So, you know, we, we, uh, we live in an age, I guess, of abundant chesed, of abundant kindness and goodness. We live in a world where we have houses, we have clothing, we have food, water, all our basic essentials, sanita sanitation. So really, what, what are we, what, where are things going wrong? So just some very quick data about looking at night in the uh, early last century, 1900 versus 2007. I don't know. Oh, you can read it. Um, the main top ten causes of death, obviously. Previously, it used to be, you know, all the infectious diseases. And now, this is 2000. This data is a little bit old already. Um, <clears throat> you know, heart disease, cancer, stroke. And through my talk, I'll prove how most of those things are caused by um, lifestyle. Diabetes is way down the list now. I think by now, 2018, that's probably jumped up number of number of places. So what is the state of the nation today, 2018? And these are some really, really alarming statistics. And I'm going to talk about diabetes because it is the sort of example, the par, example par excellence of all the issues, all the problems with our lifestyle and the current um, state of ill health that too many of us are suffering. So 280 Australians every day, every single day, develop type diabetes. That is one person every five minutes. Now, I had a patient last week in my, in my office who act, was actually one of my clinical educators when I was a medical student and junior doctor at Royal Melbourne Hospital. And she's a senior rheumatologist. And she told me this extremely alarming statistic that when I told her I was coming to do this talk, that they recently did a little, just went round the hospital in one day and asked questions. 50%, over 50% of the patients in the hospital, inpatients at any one time, have diabetes. Alarming. Um, here's just, I, I love this little, the top slide, but basically, I don't know how you can see, but it, it basically graphs in the state, all the states of America, the rates of obesity over the years, um, and then the bottom one is the rates of di diabetes, so they've clear correlation, the more overweight people are, the more, di the more diabetes there is, um, and then um, this one, um, <coughs> percentage of, di of people diagnosed with diabetes, but that's also old data, it's much higher than that now, and in, a, you know, Often we, talk, we use American data and people get a little, why are we always talking about the Americans? What about in Australia? Don't worry, we're on par. We don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Childhood obesity. This is another really alarming uh, statistic which is very much indicative also of the poor state of our health. 
I don't know if any of you, of you saw in The Australian a couple of days ago, Ruth Ostro wrote an article. Um, she spoke about how she'd recently been on holidays to Southeast Asia. And they had a wonderful time and all the wonderful things they do in Southeast Asia. But she, what she found truly alarming was the rate of overweight and obese children in Southeast Asia. Again, this is quite a new phenomenon. Um, and it is alarming. So, in other words, not only have we done it in our own, you know, America, Australia, England, New Zealand, all the, you know, top nations, but Southeast Asia is uh, following close, but very, very close behind. So, the other... I, I'm sorry to give all the, all the bad news first. Sometimes we do... The, we, we start off with the negatives, the bad news, and then we'll get to the good news. That we are the first currently... The recent data, 2016 data, indicates that our ch children born today are going to have a lower life expectancy for the first time in, since we've had all the wonderful health improvements. And that is, you know, <laughs> frightening. We are all here tonight, though, to do something about it. The question I pose is why? Why is this? There's a pretty simple answer. <laughs> That's it. Now, I was very careful. I don't want to get sued. So <laughs> clearly everyone knows what that is and who that is. But I was, you know, wanted just to maybe keep it a little bit obscure, perhaps, not really. But anyway, the march, and I, and I especially used Ronald, not just the... I was just looking for the big arch symbol. And I thought, no, no, Ron, it's important to have Ronald because he's marching through the world. As he marches through the world, and there is good evidence and good data, as he's gone into China, as he's gone into India, as he's gone into all the Southeast Asian countries, the rates of obesity, the rates of diabetes, the rates of childhood obesity are skyrocketing. So thank you very much. But now, I don't want to blame him only because it's not just fast food. And I, I also found some stats and graphs about the rate of, you know, fast food meals and takeaway meals, you know, and they, you can track them against the rates of diabetes and obesity. It's also highly processed foods that we've come to eat. So just before we move on, just, you know, a few more statistics again so no one should think that we only present American data. So in Australia in, you know, 2011, 2012, that's the rates of adult obesity rates and they're just getting more. It's probably... So the darker the colour, the higher the rate and those figures keep getting worse. And the graph on the side again. So this is actually really interesting. So the other big issue is that we... You know, 30, 40 years ago, the medical world tried to make it sound like it, like it was easy. So they kept looking for the villain. So, th you know, the race was on who's the villain, why? It was really they were actually looking at the causes of heart disease rather than the rates of obesity and diabetes because it wasn't such a problem back in the 1960s, 70s as compared to what it is today. So they were looking, why is there so much heart disease? And so they did all this stuff and they said, well, it, as it's, it's well known, I won't go into the detail, saturated fat is the villain. And if we all stop eating fat, we all stop eating saturated fat and only drink skinny milk and only have, you know, vegetable oil, life will be great. So they came at the first dietary guidelines in 1980 and then the common, the food pyramid, I'm sure you've all seen it, 7 to 11 serves of whole grains, tiny little bit of fat up the top of the pyramid. So as you can see, since those things have been introduced, the rates of diabetes have continued to climb and climb and climb. Something is not right about the oversimplification that we were led to believe. Now, I said I'm talking about diabetes, but just to be clear, the rates of chronic illness um, are all skyrocketing. It's not just diabetes, but diabetes is sort of pretty, as I said, the sort of par excellence. Dementia is now referred to by many in the know as type 3 diabetes because there is a very clear correlation between highly processed, sh over, uh, sugary diets. People with um, uncontrolled diabetes are at much greater risk of developing dementia and people who have uncontrolled, the poorly, the worse controlled, less controlled their diabetes is the higher the risk of developing dementia. There's a very clear correlation between it. Let's not kid ourselves. Um, it's not only, the other, uh, just before I go on, we talk about lack of, lack of health and, and lack of well-being. Chronic illness is a, a hallmark sign also of these problems. In other words, as I said before, people aren't dying from T, well, thankfully, from, you know, pneumonia and infectious disease by and large, although, you know, we talk about the flu every year. But these are the things that are really affecting people. <coughs> Why? Where does food fit into all of this? And this is the answer. So it's not just Ronald McDonald, but when we look at the supermarket shelves today, most of the food that is in there was not there 100 years ago. It was not there in our grandparents' and our great-grandparents' time. I've forgotten this number of, the average number of 
items, I'm not going to call it food, items in the average supermarket, but it's, you know, in the hundreds of thousands. And the, all that I've talked about so far is there's something very wrong. Life expecting disease getting shorter, childhood obesity, adult obesity, adult diabetes, chronic illness, unwellness, lack of good health and well-being. What is going on? We need to do something. We need to turn around. So this is just a little graph. And as I mentioned before, you know, 30, 40 years ago, they had us believe that the problem was we eat too much fat and if we'll just stop eating the fat, we'll all be healthy. Here you can see represented the average intake of butter in America, you know, the beginning of the last century compared, you know, and it fell, 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 fell away. It's had a, starting to have a modest increase, which is, which is uh, heartwarming, literally. Good for your heart. Anyway, um, so, yeah, and so, anyway, that's just a little thing about we've got to turn back, we've got to go back. So, so far, as I said, I've presented lots of negative and stuff and I don't want anyone to leave here on the negative. What can we do? And this is really key and this is really the message for tonight is that we need to be eating real food. And what is real food? It's usually whole. It usually, it's either grown... In the, one thing that I talk to people about, it either grows in the ground, on a tree, it crawls or it walks on the earth or swims under the water. Any of those things are things that we should be eating. Things that have ingredients that you can pronounce. Foods that have... Except for they use their quinoa. I like that one. Because quinoa, a lot of people, when they first saw that word quinoa, they weren't... So they, you know say quinoa, maybe that's what people have had difficulty pronouncing. But foods have one or two or, you know, single digit, uh, very few ingredients are things that we consider real food. They tend to be nutrient dense. They have a lot of nutrition in them. As opposed to these other things that we're not going to call, They're, here it's called processed food, but then possibly not really even, should be even, shouldn't be even allowed to call them food. Um... You know, and it talks about there, they've got long list of ingredients you can't pronounce them, you need a degree to understand what they are. They often contain um, colours and flavours and all sorts of artificial things. So, what do we need to be doing? As I said, we need to be eating real food, not food-like products. In general, something that's grown, sold whole, an apple, a pear, a peach, a banana, an egg. Real foods are variable in their quality. Um... We went once when my, our children were younger to Mildura to the orange grove and we saw, my, the kids saw, how the oranges, you know, <coughs> only the ones that are, you know, really pretty symmetrical and even coloured and everyone, they're the ones that make it to the supermarket shelves. Anything that's got a bit of a bump or a dent in it gets rejected. I don't, we weren't quite sure what happened to them, but they get rejected. Real food is variable. Not every orange is perfect and symmetrical, no matter, obviously, in the supermarket shelf, they like it to look like that. But real food is variable. It's vibrant in colours and rich in textures. It's flavourful and seasonal. And that's another big key thing to the way that we eat. Foods that are grown locally, stored locally, sourced locally, are much more like, uh, things that we should be eating. The other thing is that real foods don't actually survive all that. We're obviously, in this day and age, we have fridges, so we can keep food a little bit longer than what it would otherwise would... Um, would otherwise be healthy to eat, but by and large they spoil easily, as opposed to what these things, these food-like products, we're not going to call them foods, they come in a container, they store in a box, you can keep them in your shelf, in your cupboard at home, they really have no connection to the land um, and they're full of lots of artificial things and things that you can't pronounce. Coke, I use Coke as the example there. There's no variance in them. All over the world, the recipe for Coke is exactly the same. <coughs> Just a little thing to just to remind you about what real foods are and are not. I, that's two minutes? Yeah. Two minutes. Okay. So the take-home message for today is what I want everyone to do before next week is to go home and go through your fridge and pantry and make a list of foods versus things that are food-like products. And the way to determine that would be, as it says there, things that we have now that are available in our supermarket shelves, but... The, your grandparents would not have had. The, um, label, the notes for this are going to be sent. People, yep. Okay. So I think it's just a very useful um, uh, activity and exercise uh, to do, to, to go and have a look at that. And then the other part of it, if you get a chance, if you spend any time in the supermarket next week, is take a photo of the ingredient panels of things that, that are going into, into, your, into your trolley.
Last but not least, the take-home message is keep it simple. Eat <coughs> real foods. And just one little thing that I saw today that I just uh, <clears throat> wanted to read out. This is from a Dr Mark Hyman who heads up uh, Wellness and Integrative Medicine um, Institute in America. Um, he talks about all the chronic disease and all the things that we've spoken about. Our bodies, our health, our children and our communities have been taken from us. It is time we take them back. It is time we say no to big food and institutionalised food injustice that is causing this slow motion genocide. Pretty strong words. It is time to free ourselves. The reason I like this is because I'm talking about this in the terms of freeing ourselves. It is a time to free ourselves from corporate interests that privatise the profits and socialise the cost of their products. Next time you pick up something to eat, ask yourself this question. Did God make this or did man make this? <laughs> we can teach our kids and teach ourselves how to choose and eat food that brings life, not the opposite. Don't, uh, don't believe the big fire. We need to educate our kids, ourselves and our communities. That's why we're all here tonight. Thank you very much. In our tradition, our relationship with food is defined in highly spiritual terminology. We should not exploit food. It should not be there simply to serve our hunger interests or even our personal quest for survival. We have to honour the food and enter into a truly consciousness relationship. Now, we haven't got time to develop that idea, but I think there's a very real place for people to investigate also what has been the three and a half thousand year Jewish spiritual tradition in context of our relationship to the vegetational world and to the animal world, but on another occasion. Now, as you know, we don't have any scope for questions, but quantum people can send any questions they wish to us and for the speakers, and you'll be able to be responded to. And those of you who put down quantum but miss a session, I'm so sorry, but you won't be able to be part of that process. I do apologize. But the study will only follow people who are here full time for obvious reasons of academic uh, uh, purposes of integrity. Mr. Joel Gershman is somebody that I've watched evolve over decades from being a young man into a developed professional, someone who's worked in an area of life which is terribly important in terms of the way that we manage our life. And in context of our presentations here, tonight's initial uh, contribution he's going to make is to look at something which you and I would not look at in context of management as average people. We think management is we'll do things first and prioritise and get it done and time manage and the like. But he's going to indicate that our core purpose, what is it that provides fulfilment in our life, plays a central role in the way that we actually manage our lives and manage time in our lives. And I'm going to ask Joel to come and do his TED talk with us. Thanks very much. Good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for having me in here to talk. It's a, a big privilege, and um, I look forward to sharing some ideas with you. Um, as Label said, my name's Joel Gershman. I work as a business coach. I help business owners to grow their businesses and also to help them live more fulfilling and meaningful lives. And I'd like to start by sharing a story with you about a client of mine. His name's Howard and he runs an e-learning business based in London in Israel. Forgive me, if you've read my book, The Mindful Entrepreneur, you may be familiar with his story. Um, but for those of you who are not, let me share some of the details with you. Howard now runs what is a very successful business and he's living with what he describes as more meaning and fulfilment than he's ever experienced in his life. But I have to say that it wasn't always that way. 
Only a few years ago, his business was literally on the verge of collapse. He was experiencing a near emotional breakdown and to be honest, he felt as though his life was closing in on him. Um, it got so bad, and I can only share this because he was willing to share this publicly, um, it got so bad that he began to consider his life insurance policy and how if he were gone, if he were to take his own life, the money might sustain his wife and his kids, at least for a few years. The question is, how did he resurrect his business and his life? And over this four-part series, I'm not going to focus, let me be clear, I'm not going to focus on how he rebuilt his business and grew his business. I want to concentrate on how he stayed sane, focused and fulfilled despite the challenges that he was experiencing in his business and in his life. And more importantly, I want to focus on how you can stay sane, focused and fulfilled in your lives, even in the face of the inevitable challenges that life will throw at you. And in this very first session, as Label mentioned, we're going to zero in on one critical foundational idea. And that is identifying what I call your core purpose. So let's start with the fundamentals. There's one core principle that really underpins my component of this whole series, the management component, and it's this. If you want to live a successful, meaningful, fulfilling life, then you need to manage your time and live your life mindfully. And when I use the word mindful, I'm not referring specifically to the kind of mindful meditation that you may learn as part of this um, quantum program. And, and, and that is a really effective and, and helpful strategy that you can utilise. But I'm referring to it rather more generically. I'm thinking of it in terms of being more deliberate, more intentional, more purposeful in terms of how you live your life. For example, as a business coach, many business owners ask me how to create businesses that can fund their desired lifestyle. And it's a valid question. But the first question you really need to ask, and the first question I ask them, is what style of life are you really after? Before we talk about the lifestyle you want to fund, what style of life are you after? In other words, what's really important to you in life? What are your core values? The reality for many people is that they're not living purposefully. They haven't defined their core values. They're often just trying to kind of just survive from one day to the next. And that's exactly where I found Howard um, just a few years back. You see, when Howard was at his lowest point, I referred him to a counsellor who challenged him with a powerful question. And it's, it's a question I think we can all ask. The counsellor said to him, clearly you're not happy and fulfilled right now. So what's missing from your life? All right. What did he answer? Howard's answer was, well, clearly money. <laughs> cash. If I just had cash right now, everything would be fine. And in one sense, Howard was right. He did need money to buy food and shelter to survive, right? at least in the short term. But in a deeper sense, he was only partially right because research shows very clearly that once our lower order needs, like food and shelter, are met, at least to a basic degree, they actually stop affecting our happiness. You may have come across a study that was done. It's now become famous by Princeton professor Daniel Kahneman. It's a fascinating study. And he surveyed low, medium and high income earners to find out how happy they were. Not surprisingly, the medium income earners were happier than the low income earners who were basically on the poverty line. That's not surprising. But interestingly, the high income earners were no happier than the medium income earners. Right? In other words, more money doesn't actually make you happier. Real fulfilment lies in the realm of what psychologists sometimes refer to as our higher order needs. And in particular, the need for self-actualization, which is a bit of psycho psychological jargon. It's really what I refer to as living meaningfully. And I think that um, Viennese Holocaust surviving um, psychotherapist Viktor Frankl 
put it best when he said the following. He said, for too long, we have been dreaming a dream from which we are now waking up. The dream that if we just improve the socioeconomic situation of people, everything will be okay. People will become happy. The truth is that as the struggle for survival has subsided, the question has emerged, survival for what? Ever more people today have the means to live, but no meaning to live for. Of course, this is, none of this is to say that we don't enjoy meeting our physical lower order needs, like taking a holiday, having a hot bath, eating an ice cream. We all enjoy that. But in the long run, these things don't actually lead to genuine fulfillment. And so my question to you is what does? Let me throw it open to you for a second. What leads to genuine meaning and fulfillment? Yeah. Impacting other people's lives. Nice. Anyone else? Service. Service, which is very much connected to that concept. Yeah. Choosing people over money. Choosing people over money. Nice. Yeah. Family. Having family. Peace. Oh, a happy family. A happy family. Yes. Having peace in your life. Having peace. Yeah. Accomplishment. Accomplishment. What does accomplishment mean to you? It's a, it's a big word, right? Achievement leads to fulfillment. Nice. Maybe one last comment. Yeah. Being positive. Being positive. In all your life. So if you if you perceive things in a positive way, that will lead to a sense of fulfillment or meaning. Uh, yeah. Okay. Last one. Last one. Go on. So are you saying are you saying that you have to be happy first before you can help other people to be happy? Yes. Um, it's an, well, it's an, well, it's an interesting concept um, because um, you know there, there's a, there's a huge amount of research to say. I think I think there's some truth in in everyone's answers, and and I don't want to dismiss any any of the answers that were given, including yours. Um, and there's, there's probably some extent to which you do need to work on yourself in order to be able to help others. Um, but I want to focus in on one research-based concept, and it's the following. Research shows that we create meaning in our lives when we focus outwards on, contrib on our contribution or impact on others, which is similar to the first couple of concepts that were mentioned. And so maybe in some ways that is contradicting a little bit about what you're saying. It's saying that by helping others, we can actually create a sense of inner meaning. Now, I would suggest that there's truth in what you're saying as well, in the sense that we should work on ourselves simultaneously. Having said that, there's evidence to suggest that when we help other people, that contributes to our own sense of meaning fulfillment. And again, if you don't mind, I'd love to refer to Viktor Frankl, because I think no one puts things as well as he does. Um, if you only ever read one book in your life, you've got to read Man's Search for Meaning because it's, it's brilliant. Um, and he said the following, the more you aim at it and make it a target, the more you're going to miss it. Happiness cannot be pursued, it must ensue. And it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself or as the byproduct of one's surrender to a person other than oneself. Then you will live to see that in the long run, happiness will follow you precisely because you had forgotten to think about it. And it's a powerful idea, but the question is, how do we apply this to our lives? Especially because meaning is so personal. You know, what's meaningful to me might not be meaningful to you or the next person. And thankfully, it's not difficult. Um, it requires you to stop and consider what is truly important to you in your life. In other words, your values. And in particular, the values that relate to the outward 
focused impact or contribution you'd like to make to the world. One powerful approach to help you uncover those internal values is an exercise that I call finding your purpose. And this is going to be your homework for this week. Right? This might sound strange if you've never done this before. If you have, um, I think you'll know it's a powerful exercise. But stick with me here. Your homework is as follows. I'm going to ask you to write your eulogy. Yes, literally to write down your own eulogy. What I want you to do, it's confronting and it's extremely powerful at the same time. Um, imagine that you're at your own funeral, looking down at your loved ones, your friends, your acquaintances, anyone and everyone you've ever cared about. And I'd like you to consider what you hope they would be saying about you, about the kind of person you were, about what you achieved, about how you impacted them in their lives. And once you've done that, I'd like you to consider, which is the, the second point there, I'd like you to look for the most important words or phrases that come out. So you can write it down either in dot point form or prose. It's really up to you. Just get it down. It doesn't matter how. But then I want you to scan through it and look to see if there are any words or phrases that seem particularly significant to you. And just, you can highlight them or circle them or do something to, to indicate that those are important words. And once you've done that, I'd like you, step three, is to identify whether there are some common themes here. And what you'll probably find is that the same words tend to pop up a number of times or similar words, similar concepts. Though that suggests that they're a theme. It suggests that it's a, there's a value there. Um, and I'd like you to identify them. And you might come up with two, three, four, five or more themes. Okay? And finally, and this is the last step, I'd like you to write what we call your core purpose statement. What that is, is it's taking those core themes and putting them into a phrase or a short sentence that really encapsulates what's, what's important to you in life. What are your core values? And it becomes a little bit like a slogan, if you like, for your life. Um, that's your homework, and we're going to, I, I believe for the quantum um, students, you're, uh, you're going to get access to a workbook, which is going to help you work through this, and you can write straight into it. Um, if you don't want to use a workbook, that's fine. You can just use a notepad, but you will have access to the workbook. Um, that is your homework for the next week. And... I just want to end by saying the following. When you have a clear sense of what's important to you in life, you can start becoming more deliberate, more mindful about making choices in your life that keep you in alignment with those purposes and values. And when you, you're living in alignment, research shows that you'll feel more fulfilled, more resilient, better able to cope, and in general, more motivated. Um, of course, defining the kind of life you want, your values, is only just the step one in the process. And next week, we're going to look at how to apply that purpose across each domain of your life. This is step one. Good luck with your task, and I look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you very much, Joel. Isn't it refreshing to have... A management, a management uh, presenter taking a holistic vantage point. We were trying to work out how are we going to provide refreshments for 162 people in this limited space. So in true spirit grow fashion, we will be bringing it to you. You will not have to go anywhere to get it. You'll be provided with the one of the most wonderful smoothies that you've ever had, conforming to every health requirement that Dr. Debbie mentioned earlier. <laughs> and in about 10, 12 minutes, we'll regroup. I advise you to stand, stretch, take one of the items. The content is as follows. Coconut milk. Turmeric, frozen mangoes and dates. 
regrouping in 10 minutes. The very fact that we've got such a magnificent uh, number of people joining us tonight is a reflection on you, meaning that there is such a significant number of people really wanting to grow, improve, and recognize that there's space for that. And I think it's the latter point that is the most wonderful aspect. That means we're humble in our self-estimate. It's people who are not humble in their self-estimate that provide a ceiling which is very low down. So I want to compliment you on this. And I want to just repeat again that although what we're doing in the sessions here is really providing the, uh, just the little bit of reveal as to what it's all about, the work that you do at home during the week is going to be the work of progress. And hopefully each week we'll build, each speaker's repeating their appearance week by week with a different facet of their topic. And that way you'll be able to have tools at your convenience to be able to develop the way that you choose. The whole purpose of the exercise ultimately is a big word, life's fulfillment happiness quotient and all these various aspects of what we're discussing each evening is a contribution to it. Our next presenter is Menachem who is going to speak on aspects of spirituality, a word that has assumed quite a different meaning in our own day and age as opposed to what was in a decade earlier or even five decades earlier most significantly. It's very broad it's very holistic, it's very total, and yet it depends on our own inner milieu. Um, Menachem's going to share with us an important anchor point as to where our personal spirituality can evolve from, from by way of a practice. If you're anything like me, you have probably thought at some point and wondered, do I really matter amongst the 7.44 billion people in this world? And if you're still like me, you've probably wondered, how much? How much am I worth? How much do I really count amongst that 7.44 billion people? Now, the answer to that question is crucial because in some groundbreaking research which became well known and publicized by Dr. John Harvey, who is the director of psychology at the ASR Rehab Hospital in Pennsylvania, he uh, wrote a book called Total Relaxation, which went on to become a bestseller. And in there, there is a chapter that speaks about this piece of research that people of religious and spiritual philosophical lifestyles who have the following answer to those questions end up living lives which are measurably more fulfilling they are measurably happier people and most of all, they have the greater ability to cope with tragedy and stress throughout their life. And here's the answer to those questions. Do I matter and how much do I matter is yes and very, very much. According to the teachings of Kabbalah, which explains what is, there is description that should this world not include any one of us, then not only would the world implode, but the entire universe would cease to exist and every spiritual cosmos would return to naught. If one person, not just in this room, not just in this city, not just in this country, but in this world was missing, the entire universe 
would not be able to continue to exist. Now, the metaphor that's not given in Kabbalah, but that, that I'm going to adapt based on an older metaphor, is very simple. If you've ever flown in, aer- in an airplane, or you're one of the privileged few in this room, and if you are, keep your head down, because I'm very jealous. But if you're one of those people who've ever been to space, <laughs> you know, wow, there are a lot of you. <laughs> I heard that nervous chuckle. If you've ever been in an aeroplane, there is one very, very simple way for an aeroplane to fall out of the sky. And it's not engine failure. It's if there is a small hole or a piece of the aeroplane cladding, an element of the wall, should fall away, it could cause the entire plane to explode and disintegrate. How much more so in space? If there is just an inch that shouldn't be there, a hole the size of an inch, and is there, the plane can begin to fall apart. It's one inch in a multi-ton piece of machinery, please. It's just an absence of metal. It's nothing. And yet, that is enough to jeopardize hundreds of millions of dollars of research in rockets in space and be able to bring down a $200 million airplane. So if this world was missing a single person in this room, all of our lives would be impacted, all of our lives would be empty, and more importantly, let's switch that around, each one of us matters and each one of us counts. The research that was done in the 80s and 90s on Buddhist monks, Orthodox Jews, as well as devout Christians, found that the people that lived very genuinely with this philosophy, we're healthier people. So I'm here to not tell you this because telling is not enough. I'm not here to explain it to you because 20 minutes is not enough. I'm here to give you your homework for the week. I almost feel like this is a game show. Like every speaker finishes. I, I can't believe I'm already finished. But every, game, every, every speaker tonight goes, and now for your homework. And I think we all feel that like that even like uh, too, uh, too early. Too early. No, no homework yet. But you know, it's, we feel very powerful giving this homework. <laughs> it's not enough to know or believe what I've just said. To know is an academic process. To believe is also quite, quite academic. It's in the mind. And there are so many things that you know, but it doesn't mean you do them. For example, my mother-in-law spoke about a number of ideas around food. A lot of you know it doesn't mean you do it. Some of you came here to be validated and the rest of you came to feel guilty. You knew what she was going to say. (laughs) Spirit Girl was never going to put on some old school doctor that's going to talk about calories being equal to calories. You knew what you were getting yourself into. And yet, for whatever reason, we don't change. And that's because knowledge doesn't change people. Practice changes people. So what I'd like to speak to you about are practices. Practice is an action. In our tradition, we split the aspects of the way we live into three components. Thought, speech, and action. But the truth is you can split those into two components because speech is already an action. In that it is very measurable, it's felt and immediately experienced by others, unlike thought, which is very much in your own head. What is thought? When you think, you are bringing... Things that exist within the ether, ideas, into a place of consciousness. You're moving them from one realm to another. The example that I like to use a lot is the chap that sat under a tree. I know what you're thinking. Is he going to talk about the Buddha? No, Isaac Newton, but thanks for playing. (laughs) Sitting under a tree and an apple falls. And with that, the birth of the theory of gravity. Now, did gravity exist before Isaac Newton and the apple tree? 100% yes. But it was at that moment that the knowledge that always existed since the beginning and the dawn of time entered into the human consciousness. It moved from one realm to another realm. But as long as it was in Isaac Newton's head and it was available, it was available for everyone else to discover. There is a famous story of the mystic in northern Israel 500 years ago, Rabbi of Cairo. And he was stuck on a particular passage. He had no idea what it was saying. 
And it says that Rabbi Yosef Kairi used to engage with the soul of an angel to learn. And he was stuck. And eventually, after some months, he worked through this piece. Years later, he heard a teenage student ask his friend in the study hall, what do you think this chapter means? I don't understand it. And his friend says, it's quite obvious. And he goes on to explain what it, what it meant. And it took Rabbi Yosef Cairo three, four months to work it out. And he had no idea, how did this teenager with inferior knowledge be able to just answer like that? And he consulted with the soul of the angel and he said, how is it that I, the mystic, took three months and that kid like that, like it was a stupid question to begin with, And the angel said, the reason that he was able to do it was because you drew the information into the realm of human consciousness. And once it was there, it became available to everyone, even those not of the same capacity as you. Which is a bit of the story of flight, of human flight, where people had been researching for so long and then there were the breakthroughs on different sides of the planet. And all of a sudden, there are three different people coming up with ideas around human flight within a matter of months. And that's because once the idea moves into the realm of consciousness, it is transcended. It is manifest. But just because it's in the consciousness, it doesn't mean it's in the world. The way to bring it into the world is through speech and action. And then it becomes able to be replicated. It's not just an invention of the mind. It becomes something that can be done. And so I would like to speak to you about how it can move spiritual energy How can we move the positive energy of the infinite from the infinite space of positivity into my life every day, despite my age, despite my employment status, despite my relationship, despite my children, despite my lack of children, despite my diet, despite everything, how can I bring the infinite kindness, the infinite happiness and the meaning into my life? And I'm going to give you an action. First thing in the morning, we have the tradition to say what is called the Modé Ani prayer. And I'm going to walk you through it. I beg your pardon? The, uh, um, no, this is the explanation. The homework will be to do the Modé Ani prayer. So listen up. Listen up. When one wakes up in the morning, normally we check our phones. <laughs> then there are a few people that don't. That's because they're not tech savvy. (laughs) They hit the old alarm clock snooze button because they're sick of hearing "Eh, eh, eh, eh." whatever it is. First thing in the morning, we usually engage with the outer world and we try to get as as quick a um, digest. We like to get a real shot into the arm of all the world's anxieties. We'll check the news, make sure plenty of people died overnight and that the crime rate in my neighborhood has gone up. And now I can finally begin my day. Good morning, dear. (laughs) Lovely. Is there a God in the world? Absolutely not. There is nothing good about today, actually. There is death in Syria. A holocaust could happen again. Nobody really cares. I'm going to have a great day because I'm going to settle this mortgage without any money and the bank manager is going to listen because there is no God in the world. And that is how we live our lives. We take in this huge amount of psychological toxins into our life instead of tapping into any positivity, any energy that is available to us. And that's because we have chosen to take the empty thing called our mind which takes a whole night to finally empty out. And the first thing is we just pour a dose of poison into it. And then we wonder, what is wrong? So I'm going to give you a different elixir to pour into that empty cup every morning. Here we go. (laughs) Brace yourself for the best two minutes of your life. You sit up in your bed. You place your right hand and your left hand together with your right hand slightly elevated, so your fingers are not perfectly aligned. Your right demonstrates the chesed side, the side of kindness and free-flowing energy. The left represents gvura, which is the left side, which is actually restraint, tension, boxy reality. And we want our day to have slightly less boxy reality and more free-flowing. And then we say, the following words, and I'm going to say it completely in Hebrew, and then I'm going to loosely translate it, and those who are receiving the quantum exercise are going to receive 
a three-line commentary to think for 60 to 120 seconds. So we say this. We don't think it. We move it away from thought into action. And as we speak, we create a reality. Something is read because it is perceived as read and because someone declares it as read, not because it's read. And so we will declare, perceive, and create the following reality. I offer thanks to you, living and eternal King, for you have mercifully restored my soul within me. Your faithfulness is great. Now let me say that in real English. The very first word of that prayer is not ani, which means I. It is actually modeh, which means acknowledgement. So the first thing that I say every morning before speaking to anyone, before saying good morning, before washing my mouth, before getting out of bed is acknowledge, give thanks. And then I acknowledge myself. It's a bit Yoda-like. Acknowledgement, I do. You first acknowledge the other. What is it that I'm acknowledging? Melachai v'kayam. The infinite, the one who doesn't sleep, the consciousness, the absolute kindness, the thing which I exist in context of, and the thing that fills me and surrounds me, the all, the one, it is completely different to me. Shehechazata bi nishmati, for it, for it has restored my soul to me. It doesn't sleep, it is a constant but it's not a passive and it's not non-conscious. It is aware that I as an individual exist and restores my soul, my individuality, my unique character, my gift to the universe, my purpose for being, and likewise everyone else's. But right now is the time to think about myself. Nishmati, my soul, my infinite connection with the one. Bechemla, with mercy. I make mistakes, and there is mercy. It's fine. Today will be another day. I will not be defined by the karma of yesterday. That is a fundamental principle in our tradition. There is mercy. I will get a fresh start. Rabba and Munatecha, how great is your faith, you the infinite, that you have allowed me to wake up another day and give life another crack. And this is what I would like you to think about, and you'll receive this in the email. Acknowledgement and thanks is what I would like to do in this moment. I acknowledge that I exist within you, you the infinite, forever, conscious, and the provider of all. I give thanks to you for returning my soul to me this morning, enabling me to give to the world in my unique way. I am filled with gratitude for, for the, I am filled with gratitude for your belief in me. That is not my own new age sort of affirmation. That is actually a very ancient traditional prayer, a mantra, if you will, that we say every morning when we wake up. If you practice those words, both the Hebrew, which draws the energy, and then silently focus on the English words so that it becomes who you are, you will find that you have a completely different view of yourself as well as people around you, as well as the context in which you live. And you'll notice that well before 28 days. Money back guarantee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Menachem. As you spoke, two pieces of information came through my mind. One was, some of you might remember the name Sebastian Coe, the first person to break the four-minute mile. In, he was in England as something that was considered impossible for decades. And immediately after he did so, several others very quickly proceeded to do likewise, even though for decades it was considered impossible. Did he put out somewhere into the ether of space the capacity that others could draw on? John Landy, Herb Elliott and the like. And then another piece of information which has been actually statistically proven that when breakthroughs take place in science or medicine in one part of the world, 
another lab in another part of the world that has been oblivious of the first lab's work comes up with the same breakthrough in an improbable way that we do put out something into the so-called ether of space that others can draw on. And this is true for each one of us. You think you're a private person? You're not. You have an, what they might call an aura around you. I don't mean something tangible. I mean that you radiate. Your neshama radiates. And other neshamas with their antennas pick it up. Therefore, a course like this to create personal responsibility of mastery so that we can actually better each other and better the world in this rather intangible way is something very real. Our next presenter is someone who is a very close friend and Mr. Sim Flint is going to speak about fitness and you wonder why does a ostensibly spiritual center speak about something so finite? And the short answer is that keeping healthy and well bodily is an absolute mitzvah in Judaism. Why? Because the body is the mechanism that allows your inner spiritual self to express through. And if you don't keep the body in good shape, your ultimate self-expression, your soul's expression, is unable to express and fulfillment and happiness elude you. That's why I'd like you to concentrate very fully and I'm very, very happy to have Sim here presenting. Thank you, Label. Thank you very much. I'm going to share with you tonight something that I'm passionate about for the last 50 years. Okay, so <coughs> at the age of 17, I started to exercise, and fitness became one of my three main patients in life. Now, when I looked at the statistic before, and I saw that 2.7% people here are interested in fitness, You know, you know how a cup, a gefilte fish feels when you get a hack on the head <laughs> before it becomes a gefilte fish. <laughs> the only thing that cheered me up was that 1.1% of you are interested in diet. <laughs> now, seriously, eight, approximately 80% of our body is made of water. Now, we know that water provides sustenance when it flows. What happens to water when it accumulates in one spot? Becomes stagnated. Then bacteria start to grow up and be happy. And it will become a swamp. That's exactly what happened to us when we sit most of the day in one spot when we don't flow. When we watch TV and let the finger exercise, <laughs> when we watch computer and Facebook, it's exactly what happens in our inner world, unfortunately. We develop many inflammatory diseases. The number one enemy today is Inflammation. Please remember this world. Go to Dr. Google and start to read about inflammation. Inflammation is number one cause for all chronic diseases. All of them, from Alzheimer to cardiovascular diseases, etc., etc. Now, 29 years ago, I opened a fantastic lifestyle medicine center with doctors in Australia, here in Melbourne. And I see it every day. Every night, I go to the research, top universities in the world, from Harvard to Tel Aviv University, and look at all the recent research, which I'm going to share with you in the next four sessions. And obviously, at the end of the manifest course, I will see 99% there, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> However, just before I start, I want to dedicate this session to 20 
tree, 646 soldiers in Israel, men and women, including many Mossad unknown agents and Shabak agents that gave their life to have this precious country we have, a homeland for all Jewish people. Let's start it. Okay, not okay. All right, we see here nutrition, exercise, stress. The best way to prevent, and even today scientifically proven, to reverse all chronic diseases is by having healthy nutrition, and I'm sure you have a great presenter, exercise, me, and stress management. Beautiful rabbis. If you combine those three components, the probability of anyone that sits here to improve the quality of life is over 90%. But you have to make the effort. As Menachem said very well, knowledge doesn't bring results. Number two, now I have to hurry. The label knows me. I live in timeless, aware timeless awareness. And for every presenter, he brought a bell for me, a siren. <laughs> okay, it all speaks by itself. Okay, everyone can read. <laughs> I started the center uh, as an osteoporosis center. So I have a very highly sophisticated X-ray machine called DEXA that measures bone density, the amount of calcium in our bone. And the relationship between nutrition, fitness, stress management, and osteoporosis, very high. People who don't exercise at high risk of fractures, being vertebral fractures, hip fractures. There are over 20,000 hip fractures in Australia every year. All direct results of osteoporosis. Now, one of the benefits, obviously, of a program, a fitness program, is <coughs> weight management. Now, unfortunately, approximately 80% of the population are overfed. Those are the facts. Many of them even obese. And obesity is regarded when body fat percentage, which I will discuss in following sessions, is when the amount of fat in the body exceeds 40% of the total weight. But being over fat is already high risk for at least 40 different chronic diseases. So how we reduce this schmaltz? What do we do? <laughs> First of all, we have to watch what we put into our mouth. Very important. In summary, and you have nutritionists talking here, not too many carbohydrates, correct protein to maintain muscle, and good quality fats. That's it. Now, it's very important to get update information. <clears throat> you know that 10 years ago, people saw an egg, they got scared. An egg. Today, it's very well known that egg, fantastic food for daily diet. You can have the eggs every day. No correlation with cholesterol whatsoever. So it's very important to keep up with scientific facts and not re just rely on past information. When it comes to exercise, there are two main parts of exercise, aerobic and muscle work resistance. Now, what is aerobic? I want to make it very clear. Every person that takes the poodle for walk, it's not an exercise. <laughs> it's not an exercise. Every 100 meters leaves the egg or sits down. You go to the light, you have to wait, slap the little thing. This is not an exercise. An exercise is a continuous movement to increase heart rate, hopefully to at least 120 beats per minute, hopefully, for a duration of over half an hour. Otherwise, no benefits. So it's very important 
to improve our heart fitness and reduce our cardiovascular risk by doing aerobic, and I can tell you now, daily. And if it's impossible, then at least five days a week. <laughs> at least five days a week. But then we're getting to muscle. Now, muscle is a very important tissue in our body. Muscle is, in many ways, chemically, and I'll not get into it, affects our level, for example, of and strength of our immune system, our metabolic rate. Aging. Aging is a catabolic mode whereby we're wasting muscle. And as a result, many other functions in the body start to deteriorate. So it's very important to keep our muscle at work. For that reason, very shortly, I'm going to divide you to three groups and give you homework. <laughs> Just before the siren goes on. As I said before, they're all working together. As your nutrition improves and your exercise level and fitness increases, your stress start to drop down. Now, it's very important to reduce stress. One of our enemies is a hormone called cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone. Cortisol will cause heart attack. Cortisol will increase inflammation. Cortisol grabs the sugar in your blood and transfers it very happily to our fat muscles <coughs> and make them grow. Cortisol makes you feel on the edge, anxious. Any, any bad news and you start to feel you are losing control. The best way to reduce cortisol is by listening to the two rabbis and do mindfulness, <laughs> eat well, and improve your fitness, the best way. And as your cortisol level reduces, your health improves. No question about it, all scientifically proven. It's not an opinion. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to give one aerobic, one strength, that will be equal to success. Okay, common diagnostic is the name of the clinic. Now, everyone that wish to get newsletters and update uh, different information regarding our health, not just exercise, but uh, hormone treatment and, and nutrition, uh, we have free newsletters that we publish ongoing. And just go to comodiagnostic.com. And everyone here that want to communicate with me regarding the program I'm giving now is welcome to my email address, which is my first name, sim, S-I-M, at comodiagnostic.com. And I'll answer every email. Now, the two exercises, the two exercises I'm going to give, obviously has to be tailored to people. So what I've decided is to divide you to three groups. First, group number one will be the group that doesn't exercise at all. Doesn't do anything. That's group number one. <laughs> Group number two, group number two are people that exercise <coughs> periodically. They are somewhere nish, uh, schmeck nish, think nish. <laughs> you know, they sometimes do, sometimes don't, as they feel like. The third group is dedicated, that have a program, and do it regularly. Okay? How many are group one? <laughs> That's, I think, my 2.7%. Good. <laughs> Fantastic. The rest, everyone knows. You can go and have coffee. I will stay with you. <laughs> group number two. Group number two, the one that... Okay. That's the majority. Fantastic. That's good. And group number three? Wow. I get excited. Okay. So, the three... The three groups will do for the next week as follows. The one that don't do anything, I would like you to walk 
40 minutes a day. Now, oh no, oh, 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 now the good news. Now the good news. The good, uh, the summary the will go soon. The good news. The good news is that you are able to walk 20 minutes twice a day. One for Shaharit and one for Mari. Okay? Two, tw 20 minutes. I'm sure you have the time for this. And if it's even harder, well, do four, 10 minutes. But walk 40 minutes a day. Now, when I say walk, you walk. You move your arms, you stand straight, you just walk. And the best measurement I can tell, share with everyone, when you exercise, and I do it myself, when I do aerobic, the best measurement is that you can't sing when you're walking. <laughs> Try to, if you can sing, you're cheating. You're cheating. You have to be slightly out of breath. But continue breathing, for God's sake. <laughs> Don't stop. Don't stop. Okay. Group number one. Group number two, the one who sometimes, yes, yeah, sometimes not. For you, I would like you to walk 50 minutes in one lot, but power walk. Increase your level to power walk, which is a hard walk, and really get your breathing movement. The one who are regular, if they're jogging, increase the pace. If they're doing other form of aerobic, like biking, or using uh, uh, a cross trainer, which I love to do, just work 20 seconds hard, 10, 10 seconds slow. 20 seconds hard, alternate, 10 seconds slow for the duration of your workout, which is at least 40 minutes. Strength. Two exercises, squats and push-ups. Group number one, squat in profile. Spread legs, arms behind your neck to keep your back straight. You sit on a chair, just to this point. You don't let your knees cross your toes. They are behind. Push your backside backwards, sitting on the chair, and pushing up. Slowly down and pushing up. Slowly down and pushing up. Now, if that's hard for you, the, one, the beginners, you rest your arm on the table at home and just go to the level you feel comfortable. For example, if your knees are not perfect and they're hurting, just to comfortable point and move out. The intermediate are doing the proper squats three times 15. 15 squats, have a rest one minute, 15 squats, have a rest one minute, or two if you need them, and the last 15 squats. But proper squats, push-ups. Oh, sorry, the, the really the good ones, <coughs> you do three of 20. Three lots of 20 squats. Push-ups. The beginners, you can do push-ups against a wall by keeping your back, your body straight, move towards the wall, bend your elbows, and push back. Slowly, everything done through resistance. And please keep on breathing. <laughs> Very important not to hold your breath. You'll be amazed how many of you will initially <coughs> hold the breath because you concentrate on the exercise. Now, push-ups is one of the best exercises. Intermediate. If you already do push-ups, fantastic. Try to do two lots of ten. If you don't, start on your knees. Okay, now you are able to stand up if you want. On your knees, straight back, towards 
the flow and up. <coughs> and again, two lots of 10. The slower you do it, the better effect it will be. The last one, the geniuses. If you're doing already proper push-ups, how many of you are doing proper push-ups? Fantastic. Now, for you, the special of the day. Spider push-ups. Who is this? Okay, spider push-ups. The one who want to see can stand up. As you go down, you bring one knee. <laughs> and so on and so forth. I thought it would be exciting. I can see already 10%. 10% here. Thank you very much. I noticed that when Sim said 40 minutes, a lot of people here almost indicated that there's no possibility whatsoever of carving out 40 minutes in a day for that. Think of the following, and I'm going to give you a very negative image. When you're lying ill in bed, 10 years younger than you wanted to be at that time, and you have all the time in the world, what if you had taken Sim's advice and for four weeks out of a 120-year life made the attempt? Think about that. You've got 40 minutes. You have more than 40 minutes. What you need is willpower, positive vision, and seeing the outcome, knowing that you're giving yourself at least another 10 years of more qualitative life. Use that as an inducement, because it happens to be true. Sim is a very capable individual in a number of ways. He pointed to Dr. Debbie Herbst for nutrition, himself for exercise, and then he conferred a rabbinical degree on our next speaker, Dr. Bev Lewis, because she is an individual who takes us through for our most potent mechanism for stress management and the use of meditation for that purpose. Bev is a very talented lady with uh, high degrees in bioengineering. She's an, uh, a teacher of meditation. She does research in a number of other very interesting areas of human activity, and we're very fortunate to have her. And I'm going to ask Dr. Bev Lewis to take us for our session on meditation. Thank you, Label, for the introduction. Uh, it truly is a pleasure and a privilege for me to be here with you tonight. So welcome to the meditation component of this series. There are many types of meditation and purposes for which meditation can be used. We will be focusing on the practical use of meditation for rebalancing the mind and the body and for enhancing our health. Before we begin, though, I'd be interested to find out who of you um, are experienced in meditation with a regular daily practice. Okay, maybe 10%. Who of you are, have an experience in meditation, do not have a daily practice, um, but possibly are looking to refresh your practice? Okay, so it's maybe 30, 40% of you. And who of you are new to meditation? Okay, roughly 20% from the show of hands. So let's begin with the understanding that meditation is an anti-stress tool. 
and that we will be looking at the anti-stress component of meditation at many different levels. The most immediate level is meditation enables us to activate the part of our autonomic nervous system called the parasympathetic nervous system that has the effect of counterbalancing and reducing the stress response. So that's the first level and the level that we will be looking to activate tonight. Then the, the um, response to that is that our inner pharmacy releases chemicals into our body that sustains the reduction of the stress response so it lasts for longer. We also have the understanding now with modern technology that over time our brain changes beneficially. And as well as that, we know that at the level of genetic expression, our cells also change in response to meditation. So it's a very potent tool. The understanding that we can tap naturally into the rebalancing mechanisms within us is a relatively new understanding in Western medical science. And it really only emerged in the 1970s. <coughs> we now know that we can bring back balance into our mind and our body. And the possibility of this is still being explored. There are many people from many disciplines working throughout the world to explore what is possible in terms of tapping into these rebalancing mechanisms that are already within us. And it's really what we're all doing here tonight as a group wanting to explore what's possible and as individuals also wanting to explore what's possible when we do tap into these mechanisms. <coughs> Although the exercises that we're going to be doing tonight are brief. It's important to remember that it's the practice of these exercises, daily if possible, that has them build in their effectiveness. So what might we see over the next 28 days in response to the simple breathing exercises that we're going to be doing together tonight and you're going to be doing at home? The spectrum is incredibly broad, anything to do with the mind and the body. So you might notice that your productivity in certain areas of your life is being enhanced. Your ability to remember things. Your sense of ease with different parts of your body, for example, your digestive system, your pain modulating system, may become more comfortable. Your sense of comfort within yourself, your ability to wind down at night could be enhanced and you could find yourself sleeping better. So there really is nothing that is beyond the spectrum of change, even in a relatively brief period over the next 28 days. <coughs> in the 20 minutes that we have together each week, we will be focusing on being in the driving seat, where the vehicle is your body and the steering wheel is your mind and you will be choosing how you focus your attention in a way that has you move forward in the direction that you want, in line with the intention that brought you here tonight. So to get a sense of what it's like to be in your driving seat, I'm going to invite you to experience or move into a simple mindful meditation. So if you'd like to move anything from your lap, and make yourself comfortable. And you can notice your feet in contact with the floor, in your shoes, and noticing 
the contact that your feet have with the floor and whether there's a difference from one foot to the other. Then you can become aware of any sounds in or around the room. And you can leave your eyes open if you want. You can direct them downwards if you want. And if you want to enhance your inner focus, you can just close your eyes, whatever you choose. Become aware now of your hands and how they're resting. Notice the sensations within your fingertips. <coughs> Become aware now of any taste in your mouth. Notice if there's a discernible scent in the air. And as you do that, become aware of some expansiveness occurring as you're taking in a breath. And how you're noticing an expansiveness very gently in your nostrils. And you can bring your awareness now to any expansiveness in the front of your chest. Possibly at the sides of your chest now, you may be noticing some expansiveness. <coughs> Possibly at the back of your chest. For some of you, you may be noticing an expansion or a movement in the abdominal region and for others of you not. And so I'd like you to bring your attention now to wherever you're noticing a gentle sense of expansion, whether it be in your nostrils as you're breathing in, being in your chest or lower part of your chest, wherever you're noticing that expansiveness. And in that space and place of connecting with your feet and your hands and noticing the expansiveness, however small, large <coughs> or in between, you are naturally coming into your driving seat where you get an awareness of your ability to choose and respond from a greater range of choices than you might have thought possible. And then when you're ready, knowing that your ability to direct yourself is going to be growing over the next 28 days, so that you can comfortably sit in your driving seat and that you can expand that comfort over the course of tonight, over the course of this series and beyond. So bring yourself back now slowly and gently into a full focus of the room. <coughs> Now I'd like to introduce you to another brief meditation practice that focuses on the breath. And we're going to use this exercise as a baseline measure of our ability as a group to focus our attention. And I'm going to report back to you on the results <coughs> next week. So the exercise quite simply is that you are going to be counting your breaths up to 10 in a row and at your own natural pace. So what the exercise looks like is this. An in and an out breath is one, one count. The next in and out breath is two and so on up to a count of 10. You need go no higher than 10. The duration of the exercise is two minutes. <coughs> 
it's important for me to say that in any of the exercises that we're doing together now or that you're doing at home, you are not trying to change anything. You are not trying to change your breathing. You are following the natural rhythm of your breath. And as you follow this natural rhythm, you will find that it will change in response as you start tapping into the parasympathetic nervous system. The other thing to say about this exercise, even though it's only two minutes in duration, is that you may find thoughts and feelings arising in the background, wanting to distract you, steer you from where you are heading. So when you notice the background thoughts and feelings wanting to steer you in another direction, all you need to do is focus back in on the counting of your breath. However, if you do lose count, be gentle with yourself. It's how we as human beings go about every day. We're on track, we're off track, we're in the middle of a track trying to find where we are. The opportunity is always there when you find yourself off track to come back on track. And so this is the opportunity if you want to start counting again from one, you can. So the exercise is quite simple. In the next two minutes, which I'll count in in a moment, you'll be sitting and literally counting your breaths. That will be your focus. At the end of two minutes, I'll be asking you to write down the highest number of breaths that you got up to when you only need to get to 10. <coughs> Okay. Oh, okay. I was gonna, yes, you're just aiming to count to ten. Yeah. Count ten breaths in a row if you can. That's the exercise. And if you get sidetracked, you'll get to a lower number. Okay. So, in your own time, when you're ready, you can start following your breath. You, again, you can do it with eyes open looking down or um, closed. So the two minutes begins now. That's one minute. If you've reached 10, you've completed the exercise. If you're still going, please keep going for another minute. Okay, the two minutes is up. That number, just to retain the number of breaths that you manage to um, count to, I would like you to write it down for me shortly. Oh, well, actually, you may as well do it now. Just write down the number of breaths you manage to count up to. Could you also write, write down whether you're planning to attend the next four sessions? Just on the next line, just put four sessions. Or if you're just casual tonight, write that down for me. And also your experience as a meditator, whether you're new 
or whether you're somebody who's experienced with a practice or experienced without a practice. So if you wouldn't mind just writing that down. And I'll be collecting that from you. And so is it two minutes? All right. So we've got two, two minutes. So if you could do that, and then I'd like to take you through a mental rehearsal. I'll talk to you about that later. No. Okay. So if you wouldn't mind writing that down, putting your pen and paper down. I've got two more minutes with you and I want to take you through a mental rehearsal of how you're going to practice during the week. Mental rehearsal. Um, and I'm being asked, mouth open, mouth closed, preferably breathing through your nose is what we're looking for, but if you're breathing through your mouth, that's fine also. No, no names. Don't. It's, you're a group. So I'd just like you now to imagine yourself where you're going to be being when you're practicing your breathing exercises. Mental rehearsal. See where you're going to be. You may have woken up, absorbed yourself in the moderni, then put your feet on the floor, connected with your feet. One minute of breathing. This exercise is one of the home assignments. The other home assignment is to notice where the breath is entering your nose. And the third choice, so you have, you choose one of three exercises. And the third choice is following where your out breath goes to. So as you're sitting there just listening to me now, just switch into noticing your out breath. This is the third exercise you can choose. And just noticing how far out from your body the out breath goes. And these exercises practice once a day, 10 counts or one minute, will enable you to focus in on being in the driving seat, <coughs> moving in the direction that you are wanting to be moving, in line with your intention of being here tonight. <coughs> Thank you. For a program that's scheduled seven speakers and we're running about only 10 minutes late, I think that's fine and we'll fine tune it for next week. Our final presenter is going to only spend between five and seven minutes demonstrating a yoga posture. And by the way, I should add that I am going to ask Bev if she wouldn't mind recording the exercises she just did and quantum people will receive an actual recording of that if she's willing to put it down, which I'm sure she will be. So our next presenter, Lauren Schneeweiss, is a psychologist who also takes a very major interest in yoga and is an accredited yoga teacher. And I thought it would be rather good if at the end of each of these four evenings she could share with us one particular aspect to create elasticity of the body and create flexibility of the body. Once again, complementing everything that Sim has said and in so doing, allowing us to have one further tool to take home in order to make ourselves a much better machine in the world at large. So I'm going to ask Lauren to come to the front and share with us. Thank you very much. And by the way, this particular exercise, Lauren, has videotaped and it will be sent to the quantum people. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Label. Yeah, my name is Lauren Schneeweiss. I'll be taking the yoga component of the course. So... 
Basically, the regular practice of yoga can be really beneficial, not only in increasing strength and balance and flexibility within the body, but also helping to calm the mind and de-stress. So each week I'm going to be showing you and demonstrating a different posture. Uh, this week we're going to be focusing on balancing, so increasing your balance. So this posture I'm going to be showing you uh, is called tree posture and I'll demonstrate how it's done. Hello everyone, today I'll be demonstrating tree pose. So to begin, start to place your weight into your right foot, then lift up your left foot, place the heel onto the right ankle. And this is a really wonderful place to stay for a more gentle variation of the balancing pose. Otherwise, if you'd like to challenge yourself a little bit further, you can raise up your left leg, place the sole of the foot onto below the knee, and then you can inhale, raise the arms, take the palms to touch and hover them above your head, taking your shoulders back and down, away from the ears. And then remain here for about 10 to 15 breaths. And to release, take your arms, take your hands back to your hips, lift up the leg, place it back down, and come up onto the toes a couple of times to stretch the ankles. And then repeat on the other side. So this pose, tree pose, it's a really wonderful pose, not only for your physical balance, but also for mental and emotional balancing as well. So give it a try. Um, try to practice it once daily for 10 breaths. Uh, see how you go. And that'll be all from me for tonight. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so as I said, that'll be available on video also. So dear friends, we have come to the uh, conclusion of the first session. I'm not going to hold you for long. Any first session is an introduction. You got to meet the speakers, you got to understand each presenter and the field they arise from. There will be, as time goes on, synergy in the way that you find the exercises that those of you who conscientiously put it into your daily regimen work vis-a-vis -vis each other. Our goal is, at the end of four weeks, those of you who do carry out the regimens, will be saying to themselves, I feel considerably more wonderful than four weeks ago. This has been tested before and we're going to be testing it again here. A couple of points just before I say my goodbyes to you. The first is I was going to thank David first up. <laughs> <laughs> We have such talented individuals. He's actually a musician, a very talented one as well. Thank you very much for doing amazing work technically. The homework, I can only encourage you, please carry it out, because otherwise it will have been a nice entertainment, entertaining evening without necessarily having the desired effect which we want. Next week will not be a repeat of this week, brand new material from each one of the presenters. To the speakers, thank you very much for giving of your time. Thank you very much for being such wonderful individuals, contributing your time voluntarily as you are and enriching our lives. I really appreciate it as we all do. Go and see if you can find your car. Have a lovely evening. <laughs>